So we are recording. Uh, first off, I want to welcome everyone. I appreciate everyone taking a little bit of time out of their evening uh, to spend it with us and learn about this project and share their thoughts on it. Uh, I was pretty impressed with the, the number of people who signed up tonight, so we're pretty excited that we had a good turnout and uh, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Corey Pitts. I'm the planning section manager at MCDOT in our division of transportation engineering. And I'll run through and do just a quick uh, round of introductions of the staff and consultant team that we have with us this evening. Uh, online with us, uh, we have Dan Hibbert, who is with our uh, division of transit services. Uh, we also have Dave Onspacher from the Montgomery County Planning Department. Uh, Deanna Archie, who is also with our Montgomery County uh, Transit Services Division. Uh, we have Eric Sedaris, who is with our Montgomery County Division of Traffic and Transportation Engineering. Uh, we've got Jacob Smith, who is with the consultant team from STV. Uh, we've got Jim Bunch, who is from Mead and Hunt, also part of one of the consultant teams. Uh, Kathleen Hayes, who is with Mead and Hunt. Kyle Roberts with Mead and Hunt. Matt Johnson uh, with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation, uh, Division of Transportation Engineering. Uh, Matt Stork with STV. Paul Silverman with Mead and Hunt. Kyle Roberts with Mead and Hunt. Sandra Marks uh, with MCDOT, Division of Transportation Engineering. And then we also have Sogan Sarafi and Tim Couples also from our Division of Transportation Engineering uh, listening in. So uh, that's who we have from the county and from our consultant team. I'm going to walk through just a little bit of introduction to how to, to navigate in the Zoom environment, although I'm sure by this point many of us are very familiar with that. Um, first off, welcome again. You know, thank you for taking the time out of your evening to spend it with us. Um, as a secondary note, I did hit the record button. We are recording tonight's meeting so that we can post it up on the website once uh, we get the recording downloaded. So if you don't want your likeness or voice recorded, um, you know, don't ask questions through the audio. Uh, you can ask those through the chat and we'll go through that in a little bit. Uh, muting. Everyone is on mute. Uh, this just helps us keep the meeting running smoothly and so that people don't talk over each other uh, so that you can hear the person speaking at any given time. <clears throat> then we ask that you please keep yourself on mute. Um, when we get to the, the Q&A portions of the meeting tonight, uh, we'll uh, ask that you raise your hand and that way we can acknowledge you and unmute you uh, so that you can ask your question. Uh, if you have called in by telephone, uh, you can unmute yourself uh, when uh, when we've acknowledged you by hitting star six. <clears throat> uh, if you have questions during the presentation, you can send it via the chat function. Uh, to send a chat, uh, there's a chat window that uh, on the bottom of the menu, or I guess if you have your menu on the top of your screen, uh, hit the chat button and a new window will appear and you can type your question and send it. Uh, you can go ahead and just send it to everyone. There is a drop down menu in that chat function um, and have it selected to everyone. And we've got a staff member who's monitoring the chat and can break into the conversation and ask your question. Raising your hand. If you would like to raise your hand to ask a question or to make a comment, uh, you can click on the reactions button. Uh, that should be one of the, the features on your screen. Yeah, click on the reactions button and then another window will pop up with some emojis and a raise hand button. Uh, you can click the raise hand button. It'll alert us that someone has raised their hand and we'll acknowledge you. If you have dialed in by phone and you're not calling in through either the Zoom app or on your computer, you can hit star nine and that will alert us that you've raised your hand. So tonight's agenda, uh, we've gone through introductions. Uh, we're gonna walk through the previous study and what's been done to date and give a quick summary of that. Uh, and then we'll transition into the follow-on study, the, the continuation of the, the US-29 mobility and reliability study. And we'll talk about the goals and objectives of this second phase of the study. 
Uh, we'll talk about the additional alternatives that are being studied, uh, which is really the, the focus of tonight's meeting is we want to collect feedback on those additional alternatives before we begin our analysis of those. We'll talk about the project schedule, uh, and then we'll break out uh, into three breakout rooms just to, to make the, the number of folks in any given space asking questions a little bit smaller and more manageable. So we'll break you into breakout rooms on various topics uh, that people may be interested in, and you can engage with uh, the consultant and staff teams and ask questions. And then we'll close the breakout rooms and come back uh, and do a report out. Uh, on what each of the breakout rooms talked about. So each of us can hear what the other rooms were talking about uh, and then leave some room for questions at the very end of the, the night. Uh, I did wanna start with just a little bit of a study timeline, uh, given that we seem to have a, a quite a bit of interest in this study. I did wanna provide a little bit of perspective given that we're not starting at the very beginning. This is really a continuation of a study that's been going on since about 2018. So. Uh, this study kicked off in the spring of 2018. Um, the team pulled together some existing conditions information, and we held our first public workshop in the fall of 2018 and talked about existing conditions and alternatives that were going to be studied and collected feedback on those. And then we went away again and ran our analyses and came back in the summer of 2020 uh, and did a, a report out in our, our second workshop where we shared results of the study, uh, shared recommendations from the project team and collected feedback on those. Uh, we then took that feedback as well as the results to the planning board in the fall of 2020 and collected feedback from the planning board and then did a presentation to the council t and &E, uh, in the winter of 2021 or very early this year uh, and shared those results and the findings uh, and collected feedback from them. And their feedback was generally that they felt that there was additional study to be completed, and that's why we're here tonight. So we did kick off uh, this second phase, or what we're calling part two of the study, this summer, uh, when additional funding came uh, into the project. And so we're really just getting underway now, uh, this fall and winter, uh, having kind of developed draft alternatives that we're gonna share with you tonight, and we wanna collect feedback on it, and then we'll go away and do some analysis and come back uh, next year uh, to share the results on that. And we'll talk about kind of the schedule for the remaining pieces of the study a, a little bit later. So a little bit of background. So the purpose of the US-29 Mobility and Reliability Study is to identify improvements or a single improvement on US-29 that complement the investment in US-29 Flash from Burtonsville to the Silver Spring Transit Center. Uh, with a focus on kind of two key pieces. Uh, the first is to improve corridor travel time and reliability for really all modes that would be traveling along the corridor. Uh, that's transit users, drivers, uh, walkers, and, and cyclists. And then also to increase pedestrian and bicycle access and safety along the corridor and then to the stations themselves. So during part one of the study, uh, there were five kind of large options that were evaluated. Uh, the first one being a full-time dedicated median bus lane uh, from the extents of roughly Tech Road to Sligo Creek Parkway. Uh, and we've got some slides that'll give a little bit more detail on, on exactly what that alternative looked at. Uh, there was also a rush hour uh, bus and HOV lane uh, that would run from Musgrove Road to Spring Street and then bus on shoulder north of Musgrove Road. There were a number of intersection improvements that were studied, uh, and we'll talk through you know, where those locations were and what the specific improvements that were identified uh, were aiming to, to solve. Uh, there were a number of system and demand management measures. Uh, these are policy decisions and other actions that we can take to try and reduce non-recurring congestion as well as encourage carpooling and, and the use of alternative modes of travel. And then the last piece was the pedestrian and bicycle improvements uh, focused on better access to the stations between Silver Spring and Tech Road. So the medium bus lane concept uh, with a, an estimated conceptual cost of 100 to 110 million was looking to put bus lanes in the middle of US 29. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, the dark red sections from Tech Road to Stewart Lane and then from roughly just north of University Boulevard uh, to just south of the Beltway, 
was going to be a, a two lane or a dual lane median busway. So this is that upper image here where we'd have two lanes for the buses, one in each direction, and then three general purpose travel lanes on either side of that busway. And then in the pink or purple uh, sections, uh, that dual lane configuration would drop down to a single lane. So there'd be one lane. Uh, it may run bi-directional, meaning that the bus could, could go either way. Uh, we would have to control the bus at, at the ends of the single lane configuration, or it could also run in the peak direction. So in, in the morning, it would likely run southbound, uh, and in the evening, it would run northbound. The bus and HOV lane concept uh, with an estimated conceptual cost of 40 to 50 million um, was really focused on trying to encourage carpooling and bus usage uh, and improve performance for both of those uh, groups along the corridor. Uh, so the portion uh, at the very north uh, would actually harden the shoulder uh, and keep the three general purpose lanes and create uh, a peak period only bus and HOV lane uh, that would run in the southbound direction in the morning, uh, and then it would reverse and run on the other side of the road in the northbound direction in the afternoon. Uh, in the lower portion of the corridor, uh, this would be from Maryland 650 uh, down to just north of University Boulevard, we would look to repurpose uh, one of the, the three general purpose lanes uh, in the peak direction only during the peak hours. Uh, and create that bus in HOV lane, and then it would revert back to a general purpose lane during the non-peak hours. And then in downtown Silver Spring, where we have the managed lane configuration already with the overhead signage, uh, we would look to, to take one of those four peak period lanes uh, and convert it to a bus in HOV lane, and then it would reverse in the evening. So this would be the AM configuration. Everything would be running southbound. And then in the PM period, everything would flip and run northbound. So the lanes would reverse around and the buses would then have the advantage going in the peak direction uh, in the evening hours. These were the six intersection improvements that were identified as part of that option. Uh, the total cost uh, for all six uh, was between 20 and 25 million. Uh, and these were intersection improvements at Greencastle Road, Tech Road, Stewart Lane and also at Sligo Creek. Uh, so these intersection improvements would be adding turn lane capacity or receiving lane capacity on some of the side streets to make those intersections operate better than they currently do. And then there were interchange improvements uh, at Maryland 650. We would look to, to retain three southbound lanes uh, where we have the lane drop currently uh, to try and reduce that bottleneck that happens there at uh, Maryland 650. And then at US 29 southbound and westbound I-495, uh, we would create a second lane on the ramp to allow more vehicles uh, to exit off of US 29 and get onto the beltway to try and reduce the backup that occurs there uh, in the mornings. Uh, the transportation systems and demand management options uh, you know, had the lowest price tag, uh, one to $5 million roughly, depending on what options uh, were selected. Uh, but these are things like providing real-time travel time information from the county line uh, to the Beltway and to Silver Spring, informing drivers of how long it's gonna take to travel a certain distance. Uh, there'd be travel demand management incentive programs to try and encourage carpool, transit, and bicycle use along the corridor. Uh, we were looking at developing an integrated corridor management plan that would look at kind of all the north-south uh, major corridors, so 29, uh, I-95, US-1, and Maryland-295, and develop a consistent plan across all of those corridors, recognizing that when any one of those corridors starts to have issues with congestion or an incident, that the other corridors uh, usually end up with spillover effects uh, from that. So trying to create a, a, a cohesive plan that would address how to handle those sorts of situations. Uh, we would look to increase incident response patrols to clear incidents more quickly um, and get them out of the way so that the road could get back to operating under normal conditions. Uh, implementing smart signal technology for demand responsive timing plans. Uh, these are things that the county has been exploring and piloting for a little while now. Uh, but looking to implement those on the 29 corridor to improve how the corridor performs and how the signal systems work. 
And then the last piece uh, was providing real-time commuter park and ride space availability. There are a number of commuter lots along the corridor, uh, but this would provide signage along US 29 to inform a driver before they exited off of 29, whether the lot had space available or whether they, sh they should move on to the next available lot. So then the pedestrian and bicycle improvements uh, had a, a, a price tag of 15 to 20 million. Uh, if we took out uh, some of the major uh, improvements, uh, there were some bridges uh, and other significant improvements that aren't part of this 15 to $20 million price tag um, that we're talking about. And, and at the end of the day, there were about 200 uh, individual uh, pedestrian and bicycle recommendations between Silver Spring and Tech Road uh, that ranged from new and widened sidewalks, uh, upgrades for ADA compliance, uh, new bike routes or lanes, uh, upgrades to crossings of the US 29 corridor, um, and new bike parking and bike shares uh, located along the, the corridor. And the footnote here notes that, you know, this 15 to $20 million price tag does exclude uh, the side paths and bridges that are talked about for the US 29 corridor. I did wanna to touch a, a little bit more on the, the bicycle access and pedestrian access recommendations because I've received a number of comments um, and emails from folks leading up to this meeting. Uh, the source of the recommendations uh, were pulled from a number of different places, the first one being the Montgomery County Bicycle Master Plan. So we, the team looked at the Bicycle Master Plan, looked at all the recommendations along the US-29 and surrounding the US-29 corridor and identified those. Uh, we also looked at other area master plans and looked at the recommendations for pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure in those. And then the last thing we did is we ran a buffer around each of the flash stations about half a mile uh, and identified any gaps uh, in the pedestrian or bicycle network that weren't already captured in either of the master plans uh, that I mentioned. And that's how we kind of came up with the recommendations uh, that you've seen in the plan thus far. I did want to touch, um, we do have some active projects. Many of these are kind of in the downtown Silver Spring area. Uh, we're working on uh, completing uh, the Cameron Street to Planning Place Bikeway. Uh, that project has been in construction and is nearing completion. Uh, we're working to get the Metropolitan Branch Trail under construction. Uh, we also have a team that's working on designing the Fitton Street Bikeway. Uh, and I believe there was, some of you were probably at the meeting just last week uh, on that project. So that's in design. Um, and then we also have a team working on a shared use path along Dale Drive, and that project's at the 70% design milestone. Um, so again, talking about the sources of the recommendations, there were a number that we pulled from various places and analyses um, from the pedestrian network as well. Um, and from a pedestrian standpoint, we have a sidewalk project along Franklin Avenue uh, that's at the 70% milestone. So I, I did want to give a little bit of a note because um, I've gotten questions about, you know, what, what stage are we at? Where, what is the status of these projects? Um, so at this stage, these are all just proposed recommendations. Uh, they're not part of any active project. Um, and the, the proposals are very conceptual in nature. Um, there's no design that's been completed for them um, and none of them are funded uh, for additional study at this time. Um, the details associated with them, doing preliminary engineering to understand, you know, where the facility would go, how much right-of-way would be needed, uh, what the, the associated impacts of the project would be would occur during our facility design. Um, and that would be the next phase that would occur if funding becomes available. Um, and there would definitely be ample opportunities for community engagement um, during those next phases and continuing through final design. Um, recognizing that, you know, there's lots of opinions about these facilities and how they get designed and how they fit within the fabric uh, and the character uh, of the neighborhoods along the corridor. So I'm going to pivot uh, and, and talk a little bit about the summary uh, and the results. Um, so this is a, a graphic uh, that we showed last summer that summarized the travel time results uh, for the various alternatives along the US-29 corridor. So you can see in the dark blue, uh, the existing conditions, uh, the travel time for cars and buses, uh, the no build in the future 
for cars and buses, you know, not unexpectedly increases. Um, under the bus and HOV or managed lane concept, you can see how the, the cars, buses, and then the, the filled in car, this second car over here is a carpool. So this is those that are taking advantage of the carpool and bus lane that was created. And then you can see the travel times associated with the median bus lane. And this is in the morning southbound direction. So generally we saw um, pretty good improvements with both of the alternatives uh, in the morning southbound direction. Uh, obviously the median uh, bus lane alternative didn't do much uh, or anything to really uh, improve upon uh, general traffic conditions. In the PM direction headed northbound, uh, these are the results. And um, what we see here is that uh, the bus and HOV lane uh, showed improvements for general traffic buses as well as carpools. Uh, the median bus lane, however, we found didn't provide uh, the same level of improvements for bus that it did in the southbound morning direction. And some of this was associated with changes that occurred uh, in the burnt mills in the Four Corners area. Uh, there were lanes that were dropped, new signals that were added, uh, and it created spillback conditions that even though the bus was in its own dedicated lane, that the bus couldn't get into that dedicated lane. And then once it did, it couldn't recover the time that it lost trying to get out of downtown Silver Spring. And then there were still impacts for the general traffic. This is just a table summarizing uh, a number of things that we looked at uh, in terms of results for the, the various alternatives. Uh, so we looked at level of service uh, for both intersections and segments along the corridor. And you can see how those change. Uh, the first number uh, is uh, the morning and the number in the parentheses is the PM. Um, so the median bus lane, we saw uh, increases in level of service uh, heading towards ENF, which is the direction we don't want to see intersection performance going in uh, in the evening. Um, whereas with the, the bus and HOV lane, we didn't see those same level of impacts uh, in terms of intersections or segment level of service. Person throughput is how many people were moving through the corridor at any given time. Um, so we're not necessarily counting vehicles, but we're counting the number of people that were moving. So you know, getting more people on buses, getting more people to share share rides in their cars uh, allows us to move more people with the capacity that we have. And that's what we found with the, the bus and HOV lane concept. You can see how travel time changed uh, in the corridor for each of the alternatives. Uh, and the, the first one is for just general purpose autos. Um, so you can see how it changed um, median bus lane, you know, decreased slightly. Uh, during the AM, but increased in the PM. Um, we had decreases in both the AM and PM uh, in the bus and HOV lane concept. And then you can see travel times for uh, carpools and for the BRT. Uh, we also, uh, for both of these alternatives, because we did lay them out, uh, look at uh, right-of-way impacts at a very conceptual level. So these are very rough estimates of right-of-way impacts. Uh, but we found the median bus lane alternative had almost 10 acres of impacts associated with needing additional stormwater treatment uh, and other uh, details uh, relating to the design. Um, and then the managed lane or the, the bus HIV lane concept had a little over two acres. Uh, and then we have already touched on the costs. Uh, just as a reference point, there are 23 study intersections in the corridor uh, and 21 study segments. So if you were wondering, you know, 12 out of what? That's 12 uh, intersections um, out of 23 for some of these alternatives. Uh, and the total corridor is about 10 miles in length. So coming out of that first uh, part of the study uh, at that uh, summer 2020 workshop, uh, we did uh, propose a set of recommendations uh, for uh, feedback. Uh, and our recommendation was to advance the bus and HOV lane concept. So from Musgrove Road to Stewart Lane, we would have that peak period, peak direction, bus and HOV lane with the hard and running shoulder. Uh, from Maryland 650 to Southwood and Burnt Mills, uh, we would be repurposing to get that peak period, peak direction, carpool and bus lane. 
And then from Sligo Creek Parkway to Spring Street, uh, we would be using the overhead signage to repurpose one of those four peak direction lanes. We also recommended that the six intersection interchange improvements move forward as well. Uh, we found uh, pretty good benefits associated with each of those improving performance at various locations along the corridor. Um, we also recommended that the station access uh, bike and pedestrian improvements also move forward. Uh, when we took uh, the project uh, to the Council t and &E Committee, uh, we received a number of questions from them as well as from the Planning Board. Uh, and these are kind of the summary of those questions. The first one being, can the median bus lane be improved uh, for traffic and transit operations? So there were questions about, you know, could we do more to try and make that option perform better than it did, uh, than, than what we saw in the analysis? Um, there were also questions about re-engineering or value engineering the median bus lane to make it more cost effective. Um, there were questions about can the bus and HOV and median lane alternatives be assessed equally? Uh, and we'll touch a little bit on, on some of the differences uh, in the assessment of each of those uh, in a couple of slides. There were questions about how the modeling uh, could help further understand mode shifts uh, between carpool, transit, and single occupant vehicles. Uh, and then there were questions about the independent utility of those six intersection spot improvements. There were questions about whether one of them was, you know, more cost benefit, uh, more beneficial than any of the others. So that if we wanted to prioritize uh, those improvements, uh, we could do so. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, and he's going to walk through uh, the second phase of the study. Corey, there, there were a few clarifying questions just before in the sure. chat. Um, so one question was just about um, when the data was collected. Uh, obviously, things have changed since COVID. So when, the, when those intersections in the analysis, when was that data from? Paul, remind, I mean, I Everything was done before COVID in terms of analysis. Do you recall the specific date for the? Traffic data was um, 2017, 2018 range. Yeah. Okay, and then there, then there was a question um, just to talk about the different assumptions for the managed lanes and the median bus lane alternatives and that may come up with Paul's conversation. With yeah, I think we'll get into those in a little bit more detail in the coming slides. Um, some of them related to the intersection interchange improvements and, and which ones were included in each alternative. And then there were assumptions made on uh, the percentage of carpoolers that would take advantage of the carpool lane. So we assumed uh, a 10% increase in carpoolers in the corridor uh, in our modeling assumptions. Um, and there was a question about ridership on 29, and maybe we you may want to wait till the end for that, but um, that was another one just to understand um, the utilization of, of the flash on 29 since it started. There are a few others, but I think we can wait until, until the end for those. Okay, great. Thank you, Corey. <clears throat> so for the study continuation that we're um, undertaking now, the goals for this effort is really to um, optimize the median bus lane alternative uh, in terms of cost, in terms of geometry, and in terms of performance for the transit and for the traffic to really make it as, as good as it can be. Um, those of you that may not be as familiar with the study, we, um, you know, we were, we were given a, uh, pretty specifically defined median bus lane alternative uh, from the CAC members uh, from, uh, you know, several years ago. And that's, that's really what we started with. Um, and, um, you know, given the limited time and budget of the previous study, we didn't have an opportunity to really optimize it. So um, we're fortunate to have that time now. Uh, so we're going to do that. Um, and really assess the independent utility of the spot improvement. So the the different intersection and interchange improvements, do they have merit on their own? Should they be combined, uh, you know, with, uh, with some of the um, corridor-wide improvements, uh, the managed lane, HOV lane, bus lane, or the median lane? And then just confirm and revise all the modeling assumptions uh, related to um, carpoolers and um, ridership and so on and so forth. And uh, confirm and revise the uh, 
the planning level cost estimates, the construction cost estimates. You know, there's um, certainly been uh, some changes in the cost of uh, constructing things and, and supply chain. We have to look at that. And there's, um, you know, changes in, uh, in commuting patterns and stuff that we, we have to consider as well. So we're, we're kind of uh, um, taking a, a fresh look and see if uh, our assumptions are, are still solid. Uh, but also bearing in mind that, um, you know, I'll, this is not just a study for, um, you know, the next couple years. This is a study to reshape the corridor for the next 20 and 25 years. So, um, you know, we, we are planning for a robust future that, you know, will continue to have travel demand, um, you know, the exact uh, form of that travel demand, but we'll definitely have uh, uh, healthy travel demand uh, for, you know, all kinds of uh, commuter and, uh, and um, personal travel. Uh, next slide. So the alternatives that we're coming up with, and, and again, uh, we'd be happy to discuss some of these questions in the, in the breakout rooms in more detail. We have, a, like Corey said, a good block of time set aside for that. So the um, median bus lane with common intersection improvements. So just making sure those spot intersection improvements, I have those in the coming slides, um, are included in the median bus lane alternative as well as the managed lane alternative, which they were previously included in. Um, the second alternative that we've uh, that we're starting from, and again, we haven't um, we haven't done this analysis yet. We're just coming to you to lay it out and get some feedback, um, you know, to shape these alternatives as we as we do the engineering and analysis. Would um, include any improvements necessary to make the median bus lane operate, you know, as 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 well as it could while while maintaining you know overall general uh, good traffic flow. Then value engineering of the median bus lane. So um, one, uh, number two is really about operations of it. Number three is really about the cost of it. And we'll tell you what cost considerations we're gonna be focusing on to reduce the cost. Um, number four would be a hybrid option. So it could take, you know, alternatives from the original study, one of, one of some of the elements of these alternatives in the continuation study, bring them all together to really balance um, the operations and costs as good as possible. And then a short term interim improvements, you know, knowing that, um, you know, if we go with the managed lane or if we go with the median um, bus lane that, you know, that is not something that's gonna be built, uh, you know, in the next five to seven or maybe even 10 years. So what, what can we do in the interim to make sure that, uh, you know, we can get some operational benefit and, and uh, the county can continue to um, see benefits in the, from their investment in flash. Next slide. So value engineering, just to define this concept, uh, for, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's really taking a holistic and systematic process um, to review the cost of the project uh, and, and the elements of the project to make sure that it meets the purpose and need of the project, but doesn't uh, exceed it. And it's done at the lowest overall cost. So it still delivers value. It still delivers quality. Uh, some of the cost savings could uh, be made in the delivery of the project. So even if, you know, we have a similar cost to uh, what we came up with in the earlier part of the study, but if we find a different way to deliver it, that is cheaper or faster or less disruptive to, uh, to commuters or, or, or adjacent uh, businesses or neighborhoods, that could also um, be value engineering. Next slide. The value engineering options that we'll be looking at is um, from the median bus lane concept specifically uh, is are some of the new or reconstructed traffic signals really needed? Um, are some of the new bridge structures and retaining walls um, or uh, reconstructed structures really needed? Uh, can we do some rehabilitation or change some grading? Uh, review of the busway itself, you know, how wide do the lanes need to be? Where do you need two lanes for the buses? Where do you need one lane for the buses? Um, review of stormwater management facility type and needs. So do we have to have, you know, large ponds and retention areas or can we do some other uh, lower cost treatments? And then also looking at uh, what we call in the engineering um, industry uh, design waivers. So uh, uh, maybe slightly narrower lanes um, than is the normal standard. Um, resurfacing versus uh, um, or reconstructing the pavement, resurfacing it versus maybe just a, um, some more minor uh, pavement marking, uh, removal eradication if the pavement's still in good shape. So these are really things that can 
that can bring the cost significantly down because um, there was a $50 million difference between the two alternatives, as, as Corey noted. Uh, next slide. So I want to run through just to refresh some of the uh, intersection improvements because these um, you know, um, could be part of uh, some of the new alternatives or they, they, they may not be. Uh, so at Greencastle Road, we were looking at um, adding an eastbound right turn lane and a second southbound left turn lane and addressing pedestrian safety needs. At Peck Road, an additional uh, US 29 a turn lane in the southbound direction and widening a westbound Tech Road uh, for additional approach lane and addressing pedestrian safety. Um, the next two intersections we looked at were Stewart Lane, again, adding a second southbound left turn lane, addressing pedestrian safety needs there. And then um, the uh, uh, at 650 um, across the bridge, as you're heading southbound, adding a third through lane. So there isn't a lane drop to exit onto 650 from southbound 29 or potential additional ramp configurations or intersection configurations to um, make the traffic flow smoother through there and looking at pedestrian safety. The um, last two or, or one of the last two um, intersections was uh, the four corners area. Um, and I think some people were asking about uh, the assumptions in the median bus lane and uh, you know it was counterintuitive and so this was really um, one of the uh, critical elements of the concept uh, that we were given that we analyzed that uh, you know we went from four lanes in each direction um, through four corners down to three lanes and provided two lanes for the buses and so you know that really reduced uh, the amount of pavement where the uh, cars could um, you know, queue up getting through the beltway and those few signals there. And, um, you know, that, that created some of the friction and lost time that, that Corey mentioned. So we're going to take a close, close look at the Four Corners intersection um, and including um, the choice lane, the um, extra lane to get onto the beltway uh, to head over towards Bethesda. And then at Sligo was the last one. Um, we were looking at an additional a uh, second westbound lane across US 29. Um, that is a kind of a five leg uh, funky intersection. So um, we wanted to improve that. And, you know, the, the smoother traffic can get in and out of the side streets, the other signals, the, the smoother traffic will flow um, along 29. Next slide. We had a couple of concepts here related to station locations and design. Um, the median bus lane concept um, had proposed the station off of US 29 coming on to Lockwood and then having the buses uh, sort of loop back out. And uh, that also lost time for the buses. So we were going to look at um, potentially relocating that station right in front of uh, the Burnt Mills um, shopping center, um, you know, maybe, maybe doing a, a special PED signal there, um, pedestrian signal to get them in and out of the median. Um, and, uh, and keep the buses on the, uh, on the main line. Next slide. And then uh, also looking uh, in, in the four corner um, area and possibly relocating the northbound station. You know, again, this was where uh, we had the stations in the median and we had two lanes. So how could we, um, you know, keep traffic flowing through there, but keep the buses in their own lane? and uh, keep the uh, station platforms in a, in a safe place for pedestrians to, uh, to get on and off buses. Next slide. And uh, yeah, this was uh, just a schematic from the uh, Better BRT uh, concept for the median bus lane that we were given. And, uh, you know, it had a lot, uh, you could see seven new traffic signals and not only are traffic signals uh, expensive, but, um, you know, they also uh, slow down traffic um, along US 29 while they do, um, you know, provide some uh, better egress uh, for neighborhood uh, uh, traffic and, and pedestrians and bikes, but trying to find that balance. Um, there were also a lot of left turn restrictions proposed in this concept, which we were concerned might uh, create some uh, uh, unintended uh, spillover consequences for, uh, for commuter traffic through the neighborhoods. Um, so we really wanted to revisit uh, some of these uh, signal needs and see if we could um, we come up with a, a little better traffic operations. Next slide. 
So I know that was a lot of information and it's sort of a lot of, um, you know, intersection uh, and, and spot level details about stations and traffic controls and uh, in intersection improvements. Um, we'll we'll have, be happy to throw these slides back up in the breakout room. Uh, we're going to have three breakout rooms. One's going to be focused on traffic operations. One's going to be focused on transit service and transit operations. And the other one's going to be focused on pedestrian and bicycle access uh, to the stations. You know, it's a, it's a big investment that the county made in the flash service and the stations for flash. And, um, you know, if, the, if you can't walk or bike uh, to those bus stops, it's, uh, it's not going to be as successful. So um, those are three breakout rooms. The, the prompt questions that we have for everyone, you can see on the screen. Uh, really, we want to hear from you what mode of transportation is of most importance to you in this corridor and what project impacts are of most concern. Is it uh, how, how fast the bus is, how slow the cars are, um, how safe it is to cross the street, is it right away, is it, is it um, landscaping, whatever, whatever it is, uh, what is most concern to you? And what design elements for each mode is important? You know, are you looking for you know, a wide sidewalk? Are you looking for, um, you know, a dedicated bus lane, you know, from end to end? What, uh, what do you think is most important for each mode? And then what selection criteria uh, for each mode should be used to develop the alternatives? So as you can see from what Corey presented earlier, we primarily looked at the level of service for vehicles. We looked at the travel time for all modes, and we looked at the person throughput, how many people were moving through the corridor, you know, whether they were in a carpool, um, in a private automobile, or, or on a bus, um, or on foot or bike. So those were the metrics that we looked at. Is there any uh, other criteria that, uh, and cost, of course, is there any other criteria that you would like to see? So um, I think with that, I kick it back to Corey, and he'll explain how to get into the breakout discussion. Yes, so uh, we're creating three breakout rooms. I've seen a couple of questions uh, about how the breakout rooms are going to work. So uh, you will be able to self-select uh, which breakout room you want to go to, the traffic, transit, or bike ped. Uh, you can also leave that breakout room and go back uh, to any other breakout room if you would like to hear how the conversations are going in the other room. We will have note takers uh, in each room, and there will be a report out uh, when we come back. Um, so we'll close the breakout rooms uh, around eight o'clock and bring everyone back into the main room uh, and do a, a report out on what was discussed in each of the rooms. And then we'll leave about 15 minutes uh, at the very end uh, before we hit our 8.30 uh, closing time to answer any questions that may uh, keep or, or may come up. So uh, I'm gonna open the rooms. You should see notifications that allow you to select uh, the room and you'll click on that and say that you want to go uh, and you should be whisked away uh, virtually into the next room. Uh, so I'm going to open the rooms now. Um, so uh, you know, feel free to choose a room uh, and we'll see everyone back here in the main room uh, at about eight o'clock. Welcome back everyone. Looks like we're all back in the main room. Um, I, you know, I hope your breakout rooms uh, stimulated a lot of conversation. I know as I was popping around the rooms um, and, and listening in, I heard a lot of great conversation, some comments, um, definitely some frustrations, and I get those. Um, you know, we would all love to, to be able to move these projects forward faster and, and get to the end sooner. Um, you know, with that, I will, uh, I guess, turn it over to the uh, note takers in the various rooms so we can hear kind of what each of the rooms talked about. Um, and then we'll, we'll open it up for some last minute questions. Um, so I guess I'll start, I'll start with Eric, who I think was taking notes in the traffic room. Yes, thank you, Corey. Um, so in our traffic breakout room, uh, there were a variety of comments, but a lot of them focused on, uh, first of all, cut through traffic um, in the Timberwood area, Pierce uh, area, um, and some concerns related to not only that, but if you're going to be considering removal of certain signals or, or, or retaining certain signals, how would that affect um, 
the cut through traffic through those neighborhoods or would it make it more difficult to come in or out of those neighborhoods? Um, and that wasn't just limited to that, that area I cited, but it was, it was a general um, consensus toward the central and southern portions of the corridor. Um, in addition to that, uh, there was concerns about, um, complete, I know we mentioned complete streets and the desire to have, particularly in the southern part of the corridor, uh, a complete streets design to make it safer for um, not only people who are taking transit or, or in their cars, but also pedestrians that have narrow sidewalks that they have to travel along. Um, so just kind of considering that when making our, uh, our, our design decisions. Um, we also had, uh, uh, we specifically came up Sligo Creek Parkway and the US 29 intersection. Um, some recommendations for modifications regarding lane controls, um, considering a westbound right turn only lane, maybe that could be overlapped with the southbound lefts so on US 29 to help with flow. And then that could also potentially reduce some, uh, some diverted traffic or cut through traffic. Um, because there's some frustration, I think, with that approach, not those right turns not being able to turn easily onto our Route 29. Um, just look at my notes here quickly. Uh, there was discussion about, you know, because of COVID and the effects of COVID, you know, has has our data considered that um, for in terms of future growth and future volume projections and and, and needs? And I think Paul uh, spoke well when he kind of gave some guidance about how, you know, while we don't have any particular model that would specifically say, hey, due to COVID, this is what's going to exactly happen, um, you know, we would revisit that, that information and, and we would um, do our best to make sure that our data is accurate and reliable. Uh, let's see. Just going through my, uh, we talked about some modeling assumptions, um, the difference somehow, how we considered uh, our uh, in terms of modeling our operational models as well as our travel demand models. I know that came up a bit. Um, there was concerns about uh, bus stops in the median and, and, and pedestrians not having, you know, say if there's not a signalized intersection or a protected crossing on Route 29, um, particularly up near uh, the US uh, or the Maryland 650 interchange, some of the larger apartment complexes, people see people, you know, crossing mid block, uh, they don't go down to the signal. So there's just some, you know, safety concerns regarding that. Um, I think that that covered a lot of the major items. I may have missed a couple of, uh, of, of specific points, but I think those were the, the major ones that we talked about. Uh, Kyle or Paul, did you hear anything that I may not have mentioned? I think you did a good job. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, let's see, Deanna, would you like to share what you heard in the transit room? Sure. Um... So there was, um, there seemed to be a consensus um, in terms of the, the overall focus on, on the study should be um, dedicated to uh, dedicated bus lanes along the US 2029 20, corridor. Um, and there seems to be some concerns that the methodology, does it really address those main concerns? Um, there was, um, there was a consideration um, made to uh, study or consider neighboring um, communities along this corridor and how um, how to coordinate those those um, those communities in terms of um, those individuals that leave, live outside of the U.S. 29 corridor that are trying to get to the corridor from from external um, neighborhoods. Um, there was a, a concern um, where there was um, some mention of more metro um, along the US 29 corridor. Um, let's see. I mentioned about the concerns on the methodology. There were some questions um, concerning the ridership forecast um, in the assessments and how that is in, in being determined. Um, I think I think that covers it all. Um, Jim, is it something else that you want to add that maybe I I forgot to mention? No, I just I mean I definitely heard and there the the comments in the room basically said commenters were basically saying that the primary purpose of this study and their view 
was to implement a priority transit uh, system in the corridor, and that was the guidance that they they have they heard that the council gave us to do, um, and um, they felt in many ways that we were not taking that mission as seriously as they would like us to do it uh, in the alternatives that were presented and other things from, I mean, some of the chats were talking about, uh, you know, implementing Skyline Metro or putting full Metro systems in place. Uh, and, uh, you know, really being creative on coming up with new ways to make it a true um, world-class BRT system in US 29. There was a number of discussions in the chat also about, um, you know, let's, let's use as a parameter cost effectiveness of WMATA's Metro or something, and we're, we're being a little bit too um, uh, narrow-minded in our view of what we can do in the quarter with respect to transit. Um, and uh, we will, you know, we'll pass that information on and uh, see what we can come up with. Right. Thanks, Deanna and, and Jim. I, but Ashley dropped in I, and I heard this as I popped into the room. I know there was some frustration about the extents of the various alternatives and how some stop short of downtown Silver Spring. So all things that we'll, we'll take under consideration and look at as part of the, the next study. Matt, uh, can you share what you heard in the bike and pedestrian room? Good thing. Thank you, uh, uh, everyone, for who participated in the, the bike headroom. I thought we had a pretty good discussion, and we were still going pretty strong when we had to come back to the main room. Um, some of the common themes that we heard from several people included um, the difficulty of bicycles to pedestrians to cross the Northwest Branch, not specifically at, at Burnt Mills, but just in the sense that there are no other bridges uh, between Randolph Road and, and uh, inside the Beltway between where you can cross the Northwest Branch. So everyone who wants to get across the Northwest Branch has to cross at US 29. Uh, and there's no sidewalk on the southbound side and the northbound side has a very narrow sidewalk right next to traffic. So it's a big bottleneck and that was something we heard from several people. Um, we also heard generally about the uncomfortableness and uh, the feeling of dangerousness of the sidewalks on throughout the US 29 corridor, especially inside uh, the Beltway and south of uh, Lockwood and then the general lack um, of sidewalks altogether north of Lockwood Drive on US 29. Um, Several people mentioned um, pedestrian safety at intersections, such as um, the, the, uh, the use of permissive lefts for traffic turning off of US 29 left onto the side streets or off of the side streets left onto US 29. Um, and also just in general, trying to cross over Coles Hill Road, especially inside uh, the Beltway South of Slingo Creek where there's no median um, to, to wait halfway across. Um, we did hear from several people who were concerned about the loss of trees that might happen um, if sidewalks are constructed um, on neighborhood streets to help people get to US 29, um, in, especially inside the Beltway. Uh, and the, the general idea that losing trees is count, runs counter to the, the county's efforts on uh, reducing climate change. Um, uh, we did hear uh, a few people mention the need for a median on Colesville Road inside the Beltway to provide a, a place for people to wait halfway across. They wanted to, as pedestrians, wanted to cross Colesville Road. Um, some concern from people about the models. Um, do we know that the people who are currently driving on US 29, do we know where they're starting? Do we, do we know where they're going? And do we know that therefore transit would work for them? You know, we build a bus line, but people aren't going from yeah, they're using 29, but they're not going along the bus line uh, for their origins and destinations. They may not use the bus, so it will really reduce traffic. Um, and one thing we did hear that I thought was, uh, I thought got some nods um, in the chat uh, in the conversation was, um, uh, what about a bicycle pedestrian bridge um, over the Beltway adjacent to Colesville Road, similar to the, uh, the bike ped bridges 
at uh, Forest Glen alongside Georgia Avenue and along the Bethesda Trolley Trail um, in uh, north of Bethesda. So uh, those were the main themes. Of course, we had a really robust discussion and uh, I think we want to leave a little time at the end here. So I'm not going to go through all the details, but I did take extensive notes that I will share with you, Corey. Great. Thanks, Matt. So I'm going to share my screen to just run through just a little bit of kind of next steps. Um, and then I'm happy to leave the rest open to questions. So um, this is our schedule for this particular phase of the study. Um, we had, held a meeting with the US 29 Corridor Advisory Committee uh, back in November. Uh, we're here tonight uh, at public meeting number one uh, for this phase of the study. Um, and over the winter, we will be, you know, uh, digesting all the feedback uh, that we've heard tonight, as well as I'm sure the feedback we'll receive over the next month or so. Uh, and, and as people look at this presentation uh, and, and send comments, um, we will have a follow up uh, corridor advisory committee sometime in the late winter, early spring of 2022, once we finished our initial analysis to share those results and hear feedback on those results and on, on the assessment. Uh, and then following those CAC meetings, we'll do another public meeting to again, share results, uh, answer questions, uh, collect feedback on the various alternatives. Um, hopefully, you know, if everything <laughs> starts to turn around, maybe we can actually do that in person and, and talk uh, you know, around boards and around tables as opposed to having to do it this way, but stay tuned. Um, and then I would expect that we would do another round of meetings with the planning board uh, and the council t &E committee um, to share the results. And, and the t &E committee would be the ones that would then endorse an option to move forward with. Um, you know, we would revise the report and recommendations and, and collapse all the phase one work and phase two work into one body um, sometime in the summer. Um, here's my contact information. Um, for now, I would say the, the easiest and best way to definitely get in touch with me is email. I always have my email around um, and can answer it. Um, I'm in and out of the office. Um, we're still not back in the office 100%. Um, so, you know, happy if you want to leave a voicemail, I do check my voicemails, um, but I, I'm, I'm usually getting my emails consistently throughout the day. Um, so that's the easiest way to get in touch with me, share comments, share feedback. You know, if you want to talk more after the study, happy to talk more uh, with you and, and answer any questions that we can't get to tonight. Uh, and with that, I will open it up. Uh, to question. So if you would, uh, you know, like to, to raise your hand um, and we can go through and answer as many questions as we can uh, with the time remaining. And I see it looks like Upneet uh, has your has their hand raised. Could, I'm asking you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Yes, I just wanted to uh, say thank you for the public hearing, both as a resident and a staff member for Council Member Hucker. Uh, chair of the TNE uh, committee, and wanted to say thank you for meeting with the residents, meeting with us, and we look forward to the next step moving towards the late winter, early spring 22. Great, thank you. I see, it looks like Kwanda has their hand raised. I'm asking you to unmute yourself. You're welcome to ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, so I have a question about the um, additional studies that you're going to do as it relates to uh, reevaluating the median option and potentially making um, that solution more efficient. I'm very concerned about the reversible lane from Sligo down to Spring Street and the proposal that that reversible, reversible lane be used as a bus lane. I mean, with the decrease in, in traffic, um, in that particular um, stretch of, of Colesville, I am just wondering if, um, you know, a, a median is a better solution, especially with a turn um, lane integrated to facilitate um, the, the turns off of Colesville, I actually live on Colesville 
And, um, you know, you feel like a sitting duck when you're on Colesville trying to make, you know, a turn anywhere because it does feel like you're, um, you know, on a, on a major freeway. So um, very interested in understanding what are you going to do differently to evaluate the median option from Sligo down to spring? And what can we do to advocate for that solution? Um, Paul, do you have any th thoughts on kind of how we can assess that? And then I can take the second piece as to advocating. Yeah, I mean, um, the segment with a reversible lane is, um, is, a ch is the most challenging segment of the corridor, maybe outside of, outside of four corners. And, um, you know, there's, there's narrow lanes, there's no right of way. Um, you know, we, we want to be able to, um, you know, use maybe the reversible lane to, to prioritize the buses in there, but at the same time, it would be great to, uh, to get in a, a median to uh, assist with, uh, you know, pedestrian crossings and, and traffic calming and stuff. So, um, you know, we, we, are, we are aware of what, uh, <clears throat> what DDOT's doing with some recently announced decisions down on Connecticut Avenue. Uh, the reversible lane down there, and we'll we'll certainly take a look at that and see if they have any good ideas. Um, you know, and uh, you know maybe maybe if you know the alternative that is selected in the rest of the corridor, meaning north of Sligo, um, you know, provides enough mobility benefit um, over the whole corridor, we could we could look at something a little more creative in the reversible lane segment. Um, and then, so uh, thanks, Paul. In terms of kind of advocating, so I mean, as the technical staff, you know, we study the various alternatives. Um, you know, we will often, based on kind of our view of the analysis, make a recommendation. But ultimately, um, you know, the two bodies that weigh in the most on these technical studies are the planning board uh, and the count county council T and E committee. Um, the TNE committee is the one who ultimately would select an alternative, um, and they are the one. You know, the council is is the body that makes budget decisions in the county as well. Um, so they're the ones that kind of have the decision making authority over you know what ultimately gets implemented. I, I guess is the way I would frame that response. Uh, Alex, I see you have your hand raised. I'm asking you to unmute yourself, and you can ask your question. Yeah, so, you no, know, so I'm more just, I feel like I'm kind of also reiterating more just a lot of a, a big point from the trend from the pedestrian and bike aspect side. Like, as we've mentioned, because Col because Colesville dash Columbia Pike, whatever that, because the changes right around that area, um, is essentially a bottleneck for pedestrians and cyclists, because in order to cross the Northwest Branch, you have to go on to Colesville and the area where you have to cross essentially between Southwood or Southwood and Lockwood, the, the infrastructure there is frankly insufficient for pedestrian and cyclist safety where the sidewalks themselves either have obstructions going on, there are obstructions with telephone poles, uneven sidewalks, and when there's construction going on, the signs will take up the entire sidewalk. So talking about the entire sidewalk. So is there currently a plan essentially, I mean, for, or at least at least in proposed development to at least make the pedestrian access easier to cross the Northwest branch between Southwood and Lockwood, or at least have better, like, or is there a more, is this more as part of the study itself, or is this within the scope of the study? So in terms of facilities to, to better facilitate north-south travel along the, the US 29 corridor, the, the bicycle master plan, uh, which the planning department put out in 2018, has recommendations for the entire county uh, and, U and the US 29 corridor. So there are a set of recommendations through a combination of you know, new bike lanes, shared use paths, and other things that would then stitch together you know, one consistent path um, along the US 29 corridor. Um, many of the bicycle recommendations that 
you see listed in our study or pulled directly from that study, uh, you know, really the challenge now is, is getting the funding to advance those projects through design and then ultimately construction and implementation so that we can get them. So a lot of the upfront planning has been done. It's now, you know, we just need more funding to be able to implement those projects. Okay. And was that, was that, is that improved connection or at least a better pedestrian connection between those, between the Northwest crossing, the Northwest branch, part of the master by part of the, by the, the cyclist, the main cycle, I forget, you just said it, but I just, bicycle master plan. The, the bicycle master plan. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I didn't, Matt, I don't know. Do you want to drop maybe a link to that plan in the, the chat for folks okay. that want to access it? Okay. Uh, let's see, Jean, I see you've got your hand raised. So you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi, yes. I just want to um, support what Kwanda was saying about Colesville Road, South Chicago Creek. Actually. And I, I know I know the MC dot folks know this and everybody else who's been attending these meetings for years do too, but, but about a third of the traffic coming down 29 actually exits at the beltway. And um, I think MC dot and, and the state should look at a real road diet for 29 south of the beltway, because if you look at similar roads, um, that have the same kind of volume that 29 south of the Beltway ha has, you know, you could definitely lose a lane and, and make room for all the pedestrian and cycling infrastructure and still have a, a lane for a dedicated bus and a couple lanes for the cars on each side. You can look at 16th Street. 16th Street carries about the same volume as uh, Colesville Road south of the Beltway, and they seem to get along pretty well with a with a nice um, median safety, you know, pedestrian safety island in the middle, turn lanes, trees on both sides, a nice sidewalk, two lanes for cars on each side, and buses. So um, I just would ask you to take a look a look more closely at that. Uh, hopefully. Flash will catch on, <laughs> more people will ride it and the volume of cars driving south of the Beltway will be even less than it is now. What do you say to that? What do you say to looking at a real road diet for Colesville Road south of the Beltway with the aim of eliminating one lane and creating a, a pedestrian safety median in the middle and enhanced bicycle and pedestrian uh, ways along each side um so i think it's it could be a little challenging as part of this study that wasn't something that we were necessarily you know scoped and budgeted to do we can look and see you know what we can do within the, the confines that we have i mean i think we can definitely look at the traffic volumes and, and make some judgments on whether a road diet seems feasible whether we can get through the full study of a road diet to, to get in all the various um, pieces we'll have to look at. But I, I think we can definitely look at, you know, the traffic volumes and what we're observing and, and make some uh, judgments, uh, recommendations on whether, you know, a road diet could work to get in all of the various things. I think, you know, we're, we're trying to, to see what we can do to get the flash uh, performing better, um, you know, to, to get more space uh, for the bikes and peds, um, you know, is, is a different question that we weren't necessarily scoped to do during this phase, but we'll take a look at that. Uh, Peter, I see you've got your hand raised. If you wanna ask your question. Yeah, my, my, my only concern here, having been involved in this since the state and county looked at Route 29, what, eight, nine, 10 years ago, is that we're, we're studying this to ad nauseum. You know, on, on top of that, we've got two, we potentially have, to, we, we know we're gonna have two additional council members who are gonna come on, not sure which committees they're gonna be running or be part of. And therefore there may be delays inserted by them also, because we, we all know politicians like to take a stand and, and, and make a name for themselves. 
But uh, my biggest concern is that we're studying this ad nauseum and we're not getting down to the business of, of fixing the problem. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Ken, I see you've got your hand raised. Oh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Uh, we can. Oh, yeah. So just a question. I, I actually do. I actually do ride the uh, Metro Buzz Z8. Um, and I think the, the biggest problem I have with the flash is that I don't understand why you guys have separate bus stops for the flash and the Z8 and the Z6. I think all the bus shops should be the same bus stop, the flash and the Z8 and the Z6 and the ride on 10 and the nine and the eight. Only reason why, because when people are standing at the bus stop, when they see the Metro bus Z8 comes, they run over to the Z8 bus stop. Then when they see the flash coming, they run all the way over to the flash bus stop. And I think it's really stupid that you guys have separate bus stops. I really think everything should be integrated on one bus stop. Just like when you ride the Metro, you have the yellow line, the green line, the blue, orange, all on the same station. So it's easy because there might be a time when I'm standing at the bus stop and the Z8 hasn't come yet and there comes the flash. I don't have to run to another bus stop, run across the street, jump over poles to the other bus stop. I can just stand there and I know the flash bus will stop right there. And the same thing, vice versa. If I'm waiting for the flash and then comes the Z8, I can get on the Z8. I don't have to jump over a pole, run through a trash can to go to this flash bus stops. And my personal opinion, I think the flash bus stops look so stupid. They're like, I, I, I don't, thank God I don't live in Montgomery County because I'll be raising hell of all the money you guys wasted on that stupid bus line. You do a very bad job in promoting it because I see a lot of people still riding the uh, Metro bus and the ride on. They don't want to ride the flash. I just think it's poor marketing. If you need me, you want me to help you market, you can you can hire me, I'll help you. But overall, I think that's a big thing you guys should do is combine the bus stops to one. So all the bus stops stop at one bus stop, not 15. Little White Oak. White Oak is horrible. You have like five different bus stops. Why? Make one so we know all the buses go in one location. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan, I see you've got your hand raised and I will note that we are at 8.31, so we are past time. You know, I'm ha happy to stick around for a little bit if there are additional questions, yeah, sure. but I do wanna be cognizant of people's time. I could make this quick. I mean, are there options here to implement, you know, something that doesn't require another year and a half of study, something like a, you know, Q jumps, transit priority, um, you know, uh, off-board fare collection where you can get some of the benefits of BRT without having to do years and years of studies. I mean, this seems, you know, this is a proven technology and a proven method for getting buses to go quicker. I, I'm not sure why, um, you know, you're spending so much time evaluating it when, you know, it has been proven across the country, across the world, in a lot of different, you know, environments. Sure. Great question. So uh, the flash uh, does have the capability for off-board fare collection. Um, the county has not been collecting fares uh, during COVID. And I think the current plan is to not collect fares or to at least not collect fares until they revisit that decision uh, this next June. So in the summertime, they'll, they'll be revisiting. So if the decision is made to reinstate fares on uh, ride-on fleet buses, uh, those stations are equipped for off-board fare collection. Um, in terms of you know, transit signal priority, uh, the flash already has that at 15 locations as well. Um, you know, we could implement it at other signalized locations if we can get the funding to do so. Um, the queue jumps are a little bit more difficult. I mean, we would have to engineer those. Um, you know, there is very tight right of way along the corridor. Um, so we would have to understand, you know, what those implications would be and likely acquire additional right of way to construct uh, those queue jumps. Um, so there would be additional study to do those as well. It, it, and I get, you know, this has been done, you know, in countless places throughout the world. Um, and, and through the nation even, 
Um, but our decision makers want to understand, you know, what they're investing their money. And so, you know, that's why they ask us to do these studies so that they can make informed decisions. So we're past time, we're at 8.34. Um, I, I don't see any additional hands raised, but I do want to ask Sandra if there are any lingering questions in the chat uh, that she thinks we should answer. You muted, Sandra. Okay. Not hearing anything. Um, you know, again, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Um, you know, I know everyone's time is precious. Um, there's lots of different things that we could all be doing. Um, so I appreciate everyone taking the time out this evening. Again. If you have additional questions, if something comes to you after the fact, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is still showing up on the screen. Um, you know, happy to answer questions. Um, if you would like to have a discussion, we can set that up as well. Um, I will ask, you know, I, I was kind of surprised no one asked about kind of comment period. Um, we'll look, uh, you know, it'd be great if everyone could get comments back by um, kind of mid-January. Um, that way we can try and incorporate those into the analysis as we begin to, to start that up uh, as we come back from the new year. Um, and we look to connecting with you all again sometime soon uh, in the, the late winter, early spring to share you know, where the study goes. So thank you again, uh, everyone have a great night, uh, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Thank you everyone.